Welcome, Amazing Love. It's great to be here this morning to be with all of you. Some of you may be having difficulty recognizing that this is me. That's why I wore the shirt that I've worn a lot up here because I think in the last two weeks I've gained about 25 pounds. <laughs> it's me. And I hate long goodbyes, but I love long goodbyes. I can't even, I've lost count of how many people have taken us out to eat or we've done very farewell parties. It's been amazing and hopefully the next time you see me, I will look half of my current self. So, well, I'm excited for today. And, anybody recognize that word? And I'm sad for today because... It'll be a little while, but I've, I've learned because I've made enough farewells in my 42 years of ministry now, I've learned little strategies to sort of mitigate, and almost always I've cried, but I don't think I'm going to cry today because I've already scheduled my time to come back and torture you people some more. I had to twist Pastor Dustin's arm pretty hard. In fact, I think he went to the emergency room with a tummy ache the other day. Yeah. He told me not to pray for him this morning. I said, sure, I'm not going to pray for you this morning. All right. We are in the story of Jacob wrestling with God. And... I don't know if you've ever felt yourself to be in a situation where, and that last song was perfect for this introduction, where it, it for a little bit, doesn't feel that God is for you, that He is against you. And you, you're, you find yourself maybe, if you're familiar with that song, singing it almost defiantly. No, God is for me, not against me, because internally in your heart, your mind is saying, God's out to get me. How did that happen? And, and maybe it's because you're struggling with some guilt over a sin or sins. Maybe it's because probably even more likely of adverse events that are happening in your life. Maybe it's anticipatory anxiety and it hasn't even happened yet and you're worried that it, something disastrous is about to happen and your stomach is churning and you are so worried that the thought settles into your mind, I'm not sure God is really for me. Because if I was sure that God was for me, I know that I wouldn't be so anxious about this thing, whatever it is that's, that's coming next. And that's kind of what we're going to be talking. In fact, that's exactly what we're going to be talking about this morning. I'm going to tackle this story of Jacob wrestling with God a little bit differently. Because as I, I read through it and did my research on it, Martin Luther had a line that I really liked. He said, this is maybe the most obscure account in the entire Old Testament. What, what does that even mean that Jacob wrestled with God? Like, was that, did God come in the middle of the night and physically attack and maul Jacob? Well, the answer to that question is, we're not sure. It, it certainly seems like it was a physical altercation when you read the story. And yet, it all, we also know that there were a lot of things going on for Jacob in this moment, and I don't think it was purely physical by any means. I think it was pretty strongly a spiritual struggle, too, and an emotional struggle, and probably a struggle rationally in his mind. I mean, if you're all alone, he's, Jacob has just sent his whole family and all his possessions ahead and settled in, and I, I kind of picture this as similar to maybe Jesus being in the Garden of Gethsemane? Or even before that, the times when Jesus sent all his disciples and all the people away and said, 
go away for a little while. I just need to be with my heavenly father. That Jacob is doing something similar to that here. And maybe he's getting kind of drowsy. Doesn't say that exactly, but this is the way I picture it. He had to be tired from everything that had been happening. And all of a sudden, somebody jumps him in the dark. Remember, he's not near any city. It's probably pitch black. And he is pro his first reaction is probably, what the? If it were me, I would have thought... <laughs> That stinking Laban. We made an agreement we weren't going to bother each other, but I could never trust the guy. Or I might have thought, man, <laughs> it's been 20 years since I saw my brother Esau, and the last thing I heard from him was, I'm going to kill you for stealing that inheritance. And so, in confusion, Jacob finds himself wrestling through the night. I, I want to share with you a quote uh, from a Lutheran pastor. This is a Norwegian, very conservative Lutheran pastor. His name is Oli. You know that's Norwegian when his name is Oli, Halsby. He once got himself in trouble for talking about hell as if it's a real place. Like he got into major trouble in his Norwegian church because there were a lot of people that didn't think that hell was a, a real place. But Oli, the pastor, knew that hell was a real place and got in huge trouble talking about it that way. But he, here he talks about prayer, and that's kind of what we're talking about today. And listen to what he says. He says, when prayer is a struggle, do not worry about the prayers that you cannot pray. Have you ever been there where you're so struggling with things and then you're like, it, the thought hits your mind, well, what if I'm not praying for the right things? What if I've left something out? What if, what if God is not going to really hear me because I messed up? Well, don't worry about that, Oli says. You yourself are a prayer to God at that moment. I love that thought. The fact that you're coming to God, you're wrestling with God like Jacob. We're going to hear about how Jacob, just what he did throughout that night persistently was clearly a prayer. And then he says it out loud. All that is within you cries out to him, and he hears all the pleas that your suffering soul and body are making to him with groanings which cannot be uttered. I love, and this is a promise from Romans chapter 8, that even in our prayer life, God gives us so much grace, and he gives us so much help from the Holy Spirit. And in Romans 8, he says, I've got you covered. The Holy Spirit is praying with you when you pray. And these are the things that we're talking about this morning. So let's actually take a look at the account of Jacob wrestling with God. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. That's a river uh, to the east of the Promised Land and to the east of the River Jordan. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possession. Everyone and everything is now gone. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. And this is the line that I love, the line that I hope you'll remember from today's message. It's Jacob saying, no, I will not let you go unless you bless me. I hope this is the theme for the future of amazing love. Lord, we will not let you go unless you bless us. You are a gracious God, a forgiving God, a giving God, a kind God. We will not let you go unless you bless us. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob. Do you remember what Jacob 
what it means, the heel grabber, the deceiver. That's not who you are anymore, the man Jacob is wrestling with says. But your name is Israel, which means he struggles with God and overcomes. He contends with God and is victorious. That's kind of a cool new name. Because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. I can now tell, I think, that you're not Esau. You're, you're not Laban. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, because Jacob knew what was really going on, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel. So this was an all-night thing. And he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. Don't take that down right away. Here's something that just is a little practical tip. There are going to be a lot of those in today's message, but notice how this is not commanded by God. If you read through the whole Old Testament, you'll not find one command from God not to eat this tendon but the Israelites said, for years and centuries after this story, they said, we want to use this as a reminder to ourselves of the grace of God and of his provision for us. So this is what we're talking about. Now, I said I'm going to approach it a little bit differently because I, I want to go over some things in other places right around this account because I want you to understand what Jacob was going through in this moment. And, and what we clearly know is that this was an all-night physical, mental, emotional, and especially spiritual struggle with God. And why do we think that Jacob would not let God go? Why, why do we think that he was so determined and so persistent to be blessed by God, that nothing could deter him for the entire night, and he's wrestling with the Almighty of the universe. That's a pretty impressive feat. I used to wrestle in college. I can tell you I never wrestled all that well with anybody like God. I think I would have been done in about 15 minutes wrestling with God, but Jacob hangs in there all night long, and why? Because this takes us to ourselves now. When is it that we struggle with God? When is it when, when we might think, God just jumped me in the darkness? I wasn't expecting him to do this. Why is God my opponent instead of my friend? Why is God against me and not for me? Well, I'm going to give you three things. You can fill these out if you want to. I think the number one time that we feel like this is when we're making big decisions in life. Maybe some of you have had to make life-altering decisions in your life. This is the reason that C.S. Lewis, I'll put a quote up, says this. For times like this, he says, for most of us, the prayer in Gethsemane is the only model. Removing mountains can wait. I love that. Well, what he means by that is God has offered for us to pray to him and ask for anything we want. And, and if we just ask for things in faith, mountains can move from here to there. That's all amazing, C.S. Lewis says. But sometimes we're in the midst of this titanic struggle with, is God for us or against us? God, do I really have to do that? And so we think about Jesus praying in Gethsemane. God, do I really have to do this? God, is this really what you want? Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That is the perfect model for prayer times and struggle. And I think that's what Jacob was going through. Let's take a look at something that, that Jacob prayed slightly before he wrestled with God. This is the same chapter, Genesis 32, verse 9 says, Then Jacob prayed... 
O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, he's, he's calling God's own words back to him, go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. It was a big decision for me to say, okay, after 42 years, it's time. And we've laughed a lot about it along the way, but certainly I don't want any of you to think, oh man, Pastor Jeff, he is just so excited to get on to retirement. Yeah, and a large no at the same time. Because I have loved 42 years of being a pastor. And one of the things I hope to do, because I've loved being a pastor for 42 years, is coach younger pastors and help younger pastors grab hold of God like Jacob and say, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Pastors, like any of us, can have times when they feel isolated and lonely and, and not sure who to talk to about things. So I, I want to do that. I'm excited to do that. And I'm massively sad. I'm not going to cry. But I'm massively sad because I love this. I love teaching. I love teaching the middle schoolers in confirmation class. I love organizing and, and helping. The, I am so doggone proud of that discipleship team and the volunteer management team and the teams that were here even before I got here that have continued to do great things like our outreach team, our children's ministry team, those all pre-existed me, but I've gotten to watch them just grow and, and gather. And, and guess what those teams are? They're you. They're you raising your hands, as Dustin said, in a few weeks you're going to be given another opportunity to raise your hand and volunteer and share your gifts and talents with our church family. And I want to encourage you to pray about that and think about that because those are the things I can honestly tell you that, that give pastors such great joy that they're like, I never want to stop doing this job. It's fantastic. So... As Jacob, come back to him, is thinking about all the things that are going on, and, and, and you think about some of the big-time decisions maybe you've had to make. Do I leave Illinois, or do I stay in Illinois? I know some of you who moved to Florida, and then asked again, do I leave or do I stay? I, I know some of you have changed jobs or left your work in retirement. Do I leave or do I stay? And it can feel like a completely, and, and sometimes is a completely life-altering decision. I've watched Pastor Dustin struggle with calls over the last three years. Do I leave or do I stay? Think about Jacob. He spent 20 years with Laban in his land, which was Jacob's family's ancestral land, by the way. And now after 20 years, I'm only here for three years and I'm struggling. Imagine being somewhere 20 years where you've really prospered. And yes, there were some big annoyances with Laban. Do I leave or do I stay? And if I go this way, it's one one way of life. If I stay here, it's another way of life. Some of you don't have physical location changes. Some of you have health decisions to make that might be life-altering. Some of you might have family decisions to make that might be life-altering. And so this is so instructive for us because what, what, what does Jacob say? Lord, you said to me, I want to do what you want me to do, Lord. And James, Jesus' brother, says, that's the right approach. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? 
we're thinking this is just a big life-altering decision. But remember who you are, and in all humility, none of us is anything more than a mist, a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, the way Jacob did, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. Just because I think something is right doesn't mean it's really right. Jesus thought it was right to have God take the cup from him for a little bit. Struggling with that. And yet in the Garden of Gethsemane, in all of his anxiety and pain, in his prayer, he says, Lord, your will be done, not mine. So that's point number one. In life-altering decisions, we can pray, Lord, your will be done. So you can write that in if you'd like to. You know what makes it so hard? Let me show you about these life-altering decisions. And then we'll head into the next point. What's called a difficult decision is a difficult decision because either way you go, there are penalties. Have you ever felt that? Man, I feel like I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place. And whichever choice I make, it's just going to be painful, if not potentially disastrous. Jacob, if I stay here, I'm going to have to deal with this Laban character, my father-in-law. I don't think I can bear it. And if I go, I got Esau still there waiting to murder me for taking the inheritance, at least so he thought. And so when you're in those decisions, do what Jacob did. Lord, your will be done. Now, here's another time when we're going to really wrestle with God. And we see this with Jacob, too. It's when we're experiencing big emotions. Anybody here ever have big emotions from time to time? Thank you. I have big emotions. And sometimes it's... For those of us that have big emotions, let me just say to you, we notice when you look at us like we're crazy people, and we feel crazy sometimes with our big emotions, don't we? But we're not crazy. We just have big emotions. And man, do we need God for that. And by the way, those of you who don't put your big emotions on display, and for those of us who sometimes do put our big emotions on display, <laughs> Just because you're kind of quiet and dialed in about your big emotions doesn't mean you don't have them. Some of you are just really good at not showing your cards. And that's okay, but I will say, you still need to hear what's coming. And not think, oh, you know, I got this under control because I've, I have my big emotions, but no one knows. Sometimes you don't even know that you're having the big emotions because you're lying not only to everybody else, but to yourself. So I want you to hear this, whether you're like me and kind of emotive a little bit, or whether you like some of my best buddies who are like super contained. Let's read it. Then Rachel and Leah replied. So Jacob, this is before the prayer and the wrestling with God, Jacob has called Rachel and Leah to talk to them. Do we stay or do we go? Then Rachel and Leah replied, Do we still have any share in the inheritance of our father's estate? I mean, I think not just Jacob, but Rachel and Leah. To me, when, when people talk like that, they got some big emotions going on. Does he not regard us as foreigners? Like, we may not as well not even call ourselves his daughters anymore. We're like strangers to the guy. Not only has he sold us, but he has used up what was paid for us. Little, little kind of verbal attack there. Surely all the wealth that God took away from our father belongs to us and our children. So, here's the line, do whatever God has told you. I don't know what you're going through right now. 
Julie and me, I will tell you, we're going through a little grief. If you've ever packed up a house or, or someone's house that you love, like I still remember the day my sister and I packed up my mom's house after she died, you start thinking about all the things you're going to miss, all the things you're not going to get to do again, things that on an everyday basis you didn't even think about. Where you wash the dishes. I know it. Julie mocks me for this sometimes, lovingly, about how I kind of get emotional about little everyday things, but I don't think I'm alone. And, and so grief is one. Clearly, these ladies are a little angry and frustrated. Maybe that's the big emotion that you're experiencing as you sit here. Maybe it's fear or anxiety about your next moves in life. Maybe like Jacob, you're frustrated with some of the people around you. And you're, and you're thinking to yourself, what, what do I do with this? And you have a restless, restless heart. Your emotions are getting to you and you're trying to make solid, wise well thought out decisions, but man, those emotions are so tender and close to the surface. Anybody ever been there? Maybe I'm the only one, but I don't think so. So, so what happens here? Well, that line, do whatever God has told you. Now, in this case with Jacob, God had personally come to him and told him, you need to go back to your own home country. We don't have that luxury, so how do we do whatever God has told us in the midst of our big emotions? Well, Augustine kind of tells us, put that St. Augustine quote up. Go, that's the one. Because God has made us for himself, our hearts are restless until we do what? Until we rest our hearts in God, in him. Here's the thing. Why do we have big emotions? Because God has constructed us to be emotional people. And whether we're good at not putting them on display or not, we're all emotional beings. Because God has made all of us emotional beings with hearts. And our hearts, because of sin, are restless, constant, constantly exploring this and that solution to our restlessness. And Augustine came along, experienced himself. Some of the things Augustine tried in his youth, I won't mention because we have little ears. And you know I've quoted him a lot of times. He's a church father. He was a leader in the church. And he wrote a book called Confessions, where he just spilled the beans about all the stuff he had tried to get his heart to stop being so restless before, in his meandering journey, he finally settled on God. Maybe my heart needs God. Maybe God is that hole that I can't fill with anything else, no matter how I try. And this was what he learned. My heart is going to be restless until it rests in him. Here's what I want you to write down. In big emotions, we can follow what the Lord tells us to do. So now the question is, well, <laughs> what if God doesn't come like he did to Jacob and tell us what to do? Well, now you can put that Luther quote up. Feelings come and feelings go. This is what Luther learned about big emotions. And feelings are deceiving, or they can be. My warrant where I put my trust and what I promise to do is the Word of God. How does God talk to me so that someone can come to me, Julie can come to me, Dustin can come to me and, and say, do whatever the Lord has told you to do? Like Rachel and Leah told Jacob, well, Luther says, 
This is where God tells us what to do, in His Word. And as long as we learn this, put our hands on this, bathe our minds and our hearts in this, even memorize it, have daily devotions, come to church regularly, we're going to know what's in here, and then we're going to know, because we know what's in here, what God is telling us to do. And in big feelings, there's no greater help than to be able to go here and go, well, in my grief, this is what God tells me to do. In my anger and frustration, this is what God tells me to do. In my worry and anxiety, this is what God tells me to do. And I pray that for you because your hearts will be restless until you rest in Him. Let's tackle the final point. When we feel under threat is another time when we're going to be wrestling with God. Wonder if anybody wrestled with God. What was that, last Monday night? Do you remember what happened? Was it last Monday night? It was last week when the sirens in New Lenox were going off at least. It was last week when I called one of our members' families who don't have a basement and said... You okay? Because when I had been watching the news, it was showing little tornado touchdowns all around their house. And they were okay. And they're here today. I won't point them out, but they're here. Maybe, as I said earlier, maybe it's a financial threat and you're not sure what's going to happen with your, with your finances. Man, we've been through some rough years, haven't we? You feel under financial threat often just by going to the supermarket or the gas station. But for some of you, it's even bigger than that. Jobs have been lost. You, you, you don't know where the next one is going to come along. And, and, and you're squeezing those pennies until they're almost disappearing. And you're wondering, how, how, how am I going to feed my children? Or myself? Or the people that I love? A number of you have recently been under health threats. And we've been able to pray for you. And you're looking at diagnoses that are worrisome and troublesome and maybe voting future pain <laughs> and future expense. Maybe, maybe you feel your family under attack from the devil himself. Relationship with the spouse is a little rough these days. Your kids, who were so cute when they were young, Do things that you're just like, man, I wish you wouldn't do that. Or the flip, I wish you would do this. I think about this. I've shared this with you before. My own three boys. I got five kids, three boys, two girls. And I'm just going to ask you to keep praying for my boys because what I wish they would do is get back into a relationship with Jesus as their Savior. Come back to church. Crack their Bibles. Receive Holy Communion. And for all of you who've maybe been a little bit shaky in your faith as a younger person, if you're wondering what your Christian parents would love for you to do, it's get yourself closer to God. Because he will do things for you that your mom and dad can never do for you. By a million miles, he can do more things for you than your mom and dad can ever do for you. So I don't know what's threatening you right now. But I will tell you that you're going to find yourself wrestling with God when you feel 
under threat, whether it's tornado threat, financial threat, health threat, family threat. Take a look at what happens in Jacob's story. Back in Genesis 32, 7 to 11, it says, In great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups and the flocks and herds and camels as well. All his people, his loved ones, and all his business, which is what those things were, he divided up, and then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid. The threat was very real. Remember what the last words Esau had said to him, and he hadn't seen him since then. It was a, it was a wide distance over desert, an almost impossible journey, especially with family members. Jacob did not know what to expect, and he was afraid. He says so right here. But then we think about the things that we need to remember. There's a, there's a beautiful song, and I'm so grateful for all the songs that I've heard in the last three years here. But I think about this Chris Tomlin song. Move to that Chris Tomlin s slide. It's a picture slide. Maybe you're familiar, and we've sung this one here. If our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against us? I have to believe a thought like that passed through Jacob's mind. I hope a thought like that when you're under threat, whatever it looks like, passes through your mind. If you have to, get on Google, Chris Tomlin, if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And play that song to yourself over and over again to remind yourself these threats cannot destroy us. Psalm 46 says the same thing in the Bible. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. God is faithful. We sang that several times already today. God is faithful, and therefore we will not fear. When you're afraid, when you're under siege, crack your Bible to Psalm 46 and remind yourself, the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. I, I don't, honestly, I was not a Christian for a good long time in my life, and today I sit here and I tell you, I don't know how people do it without these truths. And in fact, I think that people are trying to do it without those truths is the reason why people are plagued with so much self-doubt and anxiety and worry and, and the need to control everything in their lives because they have no backup of knowing that God is with them and he's on their side and he's their fortress. If I leave you with just one thing, it's, it's based on Psalm 46. God's got you. And you and you and you and you. I wish I could do it to every person, look you in the eyes and say, God, he's got you. He never fails. He's faithful for you. And therefore, collectively together as a church family, we can also say, God's got us. God's got amazing love. He has a plan for us, and it's a good and gracious plan. And God never fails. Here's your final fill-in. Under great threat, we can trust God's saving promises. Okay, I'm coming back in November. I hope at least one of you, when I come back around Thanksgiving time, is, is going to tell me a story. Remember, Pastor Jeff, when you said on your last sermon, at the very end of the last sermon, that I should remember God's got me. 
that God's love for me is unfailing, that God is a faithful God. I mean, why else would our Heavenly Father send His one and only Son, Jesus, to die on a cross than His love and faithfulness toward us? Nothing more than sinners in some way. Nothing more than lost and condemned sinners, actually. And yet redeemed by the love of God, His faithful love. That's who we are. That's what we are. Redeemed because Jesus went to the cross, bled and died there for us. Redeemed because Jesus, He never failed us and He never will. So when I come back, I want to hear stories. Pastor, I got to tell you this story. You promised us in your last message. When was that? God's got you. Well, God had me, and this is what I saw happen in my life. God was faithful to me, and this is how he showed it to me over the past three or four months. God, God is with me. And I have a feeling he will always be with me because of what I've seen, what he's promised, and what he's done for me. God is my refuge and my strength. God never fails. And boy, pastor, do I have a story for you. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much that you've given us these great promises, that you've allowed me and us the last three years to share your promises together, your faithfulness. I guess we could say, shared your failure to ever fail us. You just flat out can't fail us, Lord, can you? Because you are that faithful, that loving, that kind, because of your son Jesus, because of the cross, and even there, the empty tomb. And Lord, we are confident of this by the power of your spirit, by the promises of your word, and we pray, send us a double measure of your spirit so that we get every day just a little more confident that you've got us. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Why don't you put that slide of the Lord's Prayer up because we'll, we'll touch on that. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever.